We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, folks. As you know, I like to talk about environmental policy, energy policy, because it matters. You know, there's there's a few basic things that matter in your life. Um, food is one of them. Shelter is one of them. And your energy needs are one of them. One of the big ones, actually. Um, so we're going to talk about energy. And uh, I've got a great guest today, uh, Mark Mills. Mark actually testified in front of the Environment Subcommittee subcommittee for the energy and commerce committee on april 26 on the topic of exposing the environmental human rights and national security risks of the biden administration's rush to green policies and if you listen to this podcast you know that i often reference rational environmentalism versus radical environmentalism there are ways to protect the environment um, in a rational way w- without harming human flourishing and it, and it continues to appear to me that the uh, the goal of especially the EPA under the Biden administration is to is to inhibit human flourishing. And uh, what I like about Mark, he's a physicist. I like I, I you know I I tend to think physicists are some of the best scientists and, and some of the best at, at explaining data points too in, in ways people can understand. Except for those quantum physicists, I don't know uh, they they can't seem to figure out how to explain quantum physics, but. <laughs> but, you're just um, a Newtonian face it go ahead it's all right yeah. you're a Newtonian <laughs> physicist but it's not true Mark that's the problem it's not it's, it's not accurate well, mo- most uh, physics yeah all anyway, right yeah yeah well, that's a different conversation we I, I'm happy to dive into it. it's one of my favorite topics but um so Mark Mills for everybody um really smart guy and uh, I love the way he explains things mm-hmm. and contextualizes some of the data when it comes to green energy and and especially the trade-offs because this is something that's often ignored in this debate is what are the trade-offs with energy density and reliability but also the actual environmental impact and mark just does a, a great job um, um explaining that um i'll just say about your bio real quick you know besides being a physicist that's how you started you were under you were uh, an advisor to the reagan administration senior now a senior fellow at the manhattan institute faculty fellow at northwestern university's mccormick school of engineering and applied science strategic partner with an energy tech venture fund montrose lane um and, and as i said you were white house science office advisor under president reagan written a bunch um if there's any books you'd like to talk about feel free throughout our conversation but hey mark thanks for being on the show great great to join you <laughs> thanks for having me so I, where do we begin here um you want to begin with uh well okay <laughs> well, well, well that's a, that's an interesting question so how when you're having this pretend i'm a college student and like most college students they're they're just they're just dead set on on the green energy future. Yeah. It's the only yeah. way because otherwise they're going to burn up into a ball of flame and they're terrified. I mean, <laughs> where's the proper place to even begin this conversation? We could talk about electric vehicles. We could talk about solar. We could talk about wind. Where do you even start the conversation usually? Yeah, that's it's a tough one. It, the advantage to college kids, as you know, most people in college, at least the ones I've talked to, they're still at a point in their life, most of them, not all. I mean, that they're, I mean, they're there to study mostly. I mean, they do partying is yeah. sports are fun. Who doesn't like partying in sports, but they're, they're in a, they're in a querying form of mind. You know, they're, they're in a studying framework. So they'll, they'll ask questions and listen. So it's an advantage. I mean, as we get older, we have this human nature that we begin to think we know stuff because we do, we learn more <clears throat> and we become less curious or less patient with, with listening so it's an advantage often talking to college kids. And you're right. They are they have in their heads that, you know, we have a climate problem and we got to do something. You've probably seen the Gallup poll, which was informative and dispiriting that 70 percent of Republican millennials, mm-hmm. Republican millennials think climate change is, quote, real, whatever that means. And, and more importantly, politically, that the government should do something. Yeah. did not say what, but do something. Uh, so, I mean. So what I usually do is I begin with a very simple proposition, which is hard to dispute. Whatever you think about the climate, I mean, everybody has an opinion. I got opinions. I've been studying it for decades. I have lots of friends who are climate, real climate scientists. I'm not a climate scientist, but I know enough about science. I think I know something about it. 
But whatever you think about climate science, all of the solutions fall into two buckets. One, one set are behavioral, political behavior and social, how you should behave, what you should do, how you should drive, vacation, heat, cool, mm -hmm. eat, whatever. There's a whole set of behavioral things, yeah. which I'm happy to talk about, but my general premise on that is human nature hasn't changed for all of written history because right. the reason the Greek tragedy speak to us is because we love and hate and fight for the same reasons as we did 10,000 years ago. People yep. are the same. There are, of course, those cultural differences that are important. Mm -hmm. And there are things that are different today at the, you know, the, in the minutiae, but fundamentally what we want in life, how we operate, we, it's not changed. So I not, I'm not a, a believer that there will be fundamental changes in human behavior to accommodate the climatistic apocalyptic visions. It's right. not going to happen. Agree. Could happen. I mean, you could have a Soviet Sovietization of the economy, but that always leads to revolution, of, of a literal revolution eventually. Mm -hmm. So that's one bucket. The other bucket is all about energy technology, where you began. And everything about the climate change narrative devolves to either what governments should convince you or force you to do behaviorally, and what we're going to do about energy technology. Now, the advantage of to talking just about energy technology, which is where I focus on, especially with college students, but in general. It's what most of my writing is about, is that that particular domain of science and engineering is extremely well understood. Climate science, despite claims, is poorly understood. It really, and it's a hard thing to do an experiment with. You can't experiment with what's going to happen a century from now. You're guessing. I know how airplanes work because we built them, and we can look we can look ex post facto at everything from power plants to making steel. So the science, if you're a believer in follow the science is usually what I tell students. If you believe that, and I, listen, science is not perfect. You start out, you know, with a riff on physics. We, we could go down a rabbit hole of what physics really knows and doesn't know. But some things we, we know a lot about. We have a lot of experience. And energy technology, energy physics is extraordinarily well, well understood. So what I begin with is, and let's just talk about what people are saying can be done and is being done, because we can quickly establish many of the claims about a rapid energy transition are just prima facie not true. There's no rapid transition going on. And th that's just in the data. I mean, 3% yeah. of the world's energy, three percentage points of the world's energy is produced by wind and solar today of energy, not electricity, three percentage points. The world gets 10% of all of its energy from burning wood still, burning wood globally. So we're a long way away from any kind of rapid transition. Then the question is, well, could it could it happen fast? You know, we have 0.6% of the world's cars are electric powered. 0.6% of the world's cars are electrically powered with a battery. That's not a rapid transition. It's a big market, it's a big world, but could you make it happen quicker? We we know we can answer that too, which is where I go. And the answer to that, you know, cut to the chase, is no, it's not going to happen quickly, not because of aspirations or absence of aspirations or money is these are very big systems bound by very, very clear laws of physics and engineering economics. So all of this happy talk is, you know, is right. it's like, it's silly. like, and they can make a law, you know, as California is, <laughs> um, yes. you know, you're, you're just going to have this. I, I can look, I can write a law that says I'm going to have a yeah. right eye by 2035. By 2035, <laughs> in law, I will have my eye back. Yeah. It doesn't make it so because, right. yeah. because of the physics, you know, well, the biology. In your case, case, it's biophysics, but that's yeah. okay. Well, I mean, that's, it's, you, you can make a lot of say we could fly an airplane, we could fly an airplane to the moon, but airplanes take air and there's no air in space. So you can't, they won't fly to the moon. You have to build a different machine. No, I mean, it, the, the laws that uh, 12 states have now passed to ban internal combustion engines to force everybody into electric vehicles. That's premised on a, a fraudulent, intellectually fraudulent, technically fraudulent claim. And the claim is that electric vehicles are going to get cheap fast and are inherently better than internal combustion engines. They're fine. They're all exciting. I mean, you've, you may have driven, I've driven Teslas or nice Elon yeah. Musk deserves credit for yeah. an impressive car. They're luxury cars which wealthy people for, buy. For city, for city driving. You, know, you can drive them in the country if you don't want to go, if you've got lots of time. I mean, yeah. if you don't care about spending a half hour instead of three minutes to refuel. I mean, I can refill an F-150 in five minutes. Uh, if you want to recharge an F-150's electric battery, the lightning, at a supercharger, you'll be there for 40 minutes. Now, 
Okay, 40 minutes is a long way from five minutes. You can't have millions of people doing that. I mean, these are just locked into the physical chemistry. Well, of and, and, and you know, the other false premise that maybe is worth bringing up is whether it's even that good for the environment. Well, right. I mean, because yeah. that's that that always that's always the real like there's because yeah. Yeah. The, the you know the college student in question right yeah. not the one who's worried about drinking you're right that is most of them luckily they're still worried about normal excuse me twenty <laughs> having stuff. a good time but, yeah but um but there's an increase but it's you know it's still a very different environment than when I was in college yeah um and it's it's much more politicized and people do have um a lot of opinions and they're not always well informed opinions so you know let's go let's we're talking to that person right now yeah. and um. And they're like, look, it. I don't care what you say. Yeah, yeah, it's inconvenient, but it's the price yeah. we have to pay yeah. because we're all going to burn up and die. Yeah. And so, and so, like, then, so then, all right, then. We're, we're some, so when we make the economic argument, we're actually we're actually arguing past each other because they actually don't yeah. care about. They don't that. care, or, or they think the government has infinite money and it'll just subsidize yeah. it. It'll just work out. Like, there's there's yeah. definitely a belief that it'll just work out. Um, yeah. and we'll get to the power grid uh after the EV talk, but let's still let's continue with the electric vehicle talk for now. You know, uh, I think I made this point when we were in that hearing and i don't have the data hopefully you have the, the the statistic off the top of your head but i remember you know asking my staff to look into okay what's the actual you know what's the actual emission footprint from vehicle from passenger vehicles right. inside right. the united states and it's like right. it's like 10 15 it's it's not much it's 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 not nothing but it's not much and so and so you got to do some kind of thought experiment which is let's assume it all disappears all of a sudden Let's assume all that entire footprint disappears all of a sudden. What's the effect on the environment? What is the benefit? Yeah, wow. you, you have to talk in terms of benefits, yeah. right? Yeah, you absolutely do. You have to have to do a little bit of arithmetic sometimes. And and unfortunately, especially for college students and all of us, the magic Google machine will get you pretty reasonable answers to the very basic questions, like the one you asked. I mean, what's the carbon footprint, which is what this is the obsession's about, of course, is carbon dioxide of uh, passenger vehicles in the United States, because we're talking global climate stuff, global emissions mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for global CO2 emissions. And it's a few percentage points. Uh, it's not even two, it's like two and a half. Let's just say it's, it's low single digit percentage points of global CO2 from all. Passenger so vehicles. if everybody okay. rides bicycles and walks and uh, then it has less impact than, uh, China will add more CO2 emissions in one month from the coal plants are building. Then will be eliminated by all of the U.S. driving. What about these forest bicycles. fires in Canada? Like how well, much? Like, well, my home. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, that's I don't, I don't that's old. But here, here's here's the, the. You're absolutely right. The thing is, the claim is, which is true, that an EV has no tailpipe, so it emits no carbon dioxide or anything else. Well, this is, you know, the technical term. It's a no duh. But EVs are elsewhere emission vehicles, and the joke, you know, the the Tesla kind of joke that your Tesla is powered by coal is true, depending on where you charge the vehicle and what time mm -hmm. of day, and what state, what part of the world. But this is the big issue. I mean, because everybody has in their hands, oh, well, I'll just make everything wind and solar. We'll get to that in a minute. That's not the, that's not the issue. The issue is an electric vehicle's fuel tank, it's battery, which most people who are who know EVs know this, but most people don't know this. The fuel tank is a half ton. It's a half ton battery. Your gasoline tank, depending on the car you have, probably weighs 70 or 80 pounds of gasoline. So you have a half ton fuel tank. To build that so fuel it's a tank- it's 1,000 pounds, right? 1,000 pound fuel tank. To build a 1,000 pound fuel tank, you have to mine and dig up somewhere on earth about 500,000 pounds of rock and dirt for one EV. Since all of that it, mining- explain, explain why that is, oh, if you sure. don't mind. Just, yep. Because that, that's, that gets you to the emissions that are elsewhere. The carbon right. dioxide, that's emitted by an EV happens before you drive the EV. Mm -hmm. This is how it happens. So what, what is the, what is the battery made of? So a battery is not a simple box like a little double A cell that's made with goo in it. Okay, it's a complicated machine. It's an electrochemical machine. It's actually more complex than your internal combustion engine. It contains thousands of parts, tens of thousands of welds, a cooling system, a power control system, and a structural system. It wears out just like an internal combustion engine. Engines wear out at the molecular level, the wear and tear on bearings. And so, mm. do, so do batteries. Batteries wear out electrochemically at the molecular level as well. They have a limited lifespan. If you use them too hard, they wear out faster. So they're made from copper and aluminum 
and lithium and typically cobalt and nickel and manganese. And there's a, there's a, a, a soup of metals and minerals that you have to get access to to build the battery. If you, let's take copper, because copper is non-replaceable. You just, no copper, no electric vehicles. Copper is in the winding, it's in the battery. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the cathodes and the so-called cathode and anode, the battery is made from two plates. One is right. aluminum, one's, one's copper. Copper, uh, you have to mine copper to get the copper. Copper ore, what's called an ore, the rock that contains copper is less than 1% grade copper, which put differently means if you need 20 pounds of copper, you have to mine a ton of ore, 2,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you dig up 2,000 pounds of ore and usually something on the order of 10,000 pounds of dirt that's in the way of the ore. So you dig up 10,000 pounds of stuff to get the 2,000 pounds of ore. Big trucks, big machines, then you have to grind that ore up. So I'm just talking about for one metal, copper, but this is true for all the metals. You have to grind it up with giant energy consuming machines that typically consume coal, by the way, given where the mines are. So it's coal-fired electricity or oil-fired electricity at remote mine sites, grinding up rock, crushing it into a powder. Then you have to dissolve the rock. It's like something out of science fiction. You can't get the copper out of the rock by just harvesting it. It's not, it's not, you have yeah. to grind it, dissolve it with chemicals, and then electric, you know, chemically extract the copper and then refine it. Every one of those steps involving thousands and tens of thousands of pounds of rock to get to a few, a few pounds of copper is profoundly and deeply energy consuming. It's amazing we have anything, honestly. <laughs> like yeah, like it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> Copper's used it, in everything. Just think, this is all upstream. It's invisible. And most of it happens elsewhere in Africa, in my homeland, Canada, Australia, yeah. Brazil. But it's not only energy consuming, to your point on the balance for the environment. So we can count up the carbon dioxide emitted by doing all that. Yeah. We know it's a big number. This is the key. We actually don't know how big the number is because the, the supply chains are global. They're labyrinthine, they're opaque. They involve industries we can't regulate or track all over the place. A lot of it's in China, which is on a coal-fired grid, which emits lots of carbon dioxide. So all that stuff happens before you get your, your car and your driveway, before you charge it the first time. Mm -hmm. And it involves, for that one car, the carbon dioxide emissions to build the one battery can eliminate anywhere from a third to a half of all the CO2 you save by not burning gasoline. And in many cases, results in you over the lifetime of the vehicle emitting more carbon dioxide than if you just drove the gasoline car in the first place, depending on where the copper and the nickel and came yeah. from. So a lot of it, factors it, that frankly haven't been studied. Well, I mean, is there is there at least an average, you know, a study out there that gives us yeah. a, a basic yeah. idea, an average sure. of, okay, here's sure. your, your basic four door sedan, yeah. internal combustion engine car versus your, your basic electric vehicle, yeah. what it takes to build either one, just, just based on materials alone, what the carbon footprint is. Sure. Well, we'll give credit to Volvo and Volkswagen for publishing studies on this at their websites. So really, I think Volkswagen, because they don't want to get spanked again for a diesel yeah. gate kind of thing. Uh, yeah. They don't want people later saying, you told us it was zero emissions. Mm -hmm. They're very clear it's not zero emissions. So they they put the numbers together in a pretty decent study. Uh, they did cover all the variables I described. A pretty good, pretty good study. So the Volkswagen study says that you have to drive your Volkswagen Golf, so it's a small car, mm -hmm. for 60,000 miles before it emits less CO2 than driving the diesel Golf. The first 60,000, 60, jeez. It's a long time. The Volvo did a study for a bigger vehicle. They they, they did their midsize SUV, their electric, and their midsize SUV gasoline, which is a pretty inefficient gasoline car. It's a, you know, it's one of the ones that gets an average of something like 20 miles per gallon instead of the better ones you can buy. Mm -hmm. And they, they came up with a, a better number because the bigger, yeah. a, more, a more inefficient SUV and a somewhat more efficient EV. And th their estimate is you're at about 50,000 miles depending on where you drive it. So they're counting both the grid and the up. So yeah. you lose about, you consume about half the CO2 just building the battery and another half in charging the battery. What they didn't do, this is this is the key thing about the future. We're talking about cars that we're going to build the next decade. What they didn't do, and I'm not blaming them. I'm, I'm not going to attribute motive. Yeah. <laughs> because I, 
let's be charitable because what I'm going to tell you, you, you can you can only make so many assumptions in a yeah, study, it's, right? It's, it's, it's a basic guideline. Which is as long fine. as they're honest about it, right? Here are yeah. our assumptions. You can make other, other assumptions. It changes. They're factors. there. Sure. And they're very honest, which is fine. But here's the key. If you build an electric vehicle two or three years from now, you have to mine copper in the, in the future. You want to know the trends for, we'll stick with copper. Does, does the next marginal ton of copper that you mine emit more CO2 or less than the past marginal ton? Now, if I said that for steel, I can tell you because steel industry is so mature, so big and, and, a, and a unique industry because iron ore is very common. You know, yeah. the ore grade I told you where 1% of the rock is copper. With yeah. iron, it's like you can find copper uh, iron ore grades that are 50%. It's like digging okay. up iron. Interesting. So just it's a more unique. efficient process. Okay. It's a very energy efficient process compared to copper, nickel. The next marginal ton of copper is more energy intensive. This is true for all the metals that we need Why? for batteries. Because the geology of the world, we've already found- We're running out of copper. We're running out of the- cheap copper okay. lots of copper planet has lots of stuff i'm not a malthusian yeah. but the marginal ton is more expensive in energy terms and dollar terms so if you model that which volvo doesn't do volkswagen i've done it, a new paper i've got coming out what you find out i'll put let me give you a number the a reduction in the ore grade from one percent to 0.6 percent doesn't sound like a lot increases the energy use of the copper by sevenfold yeah I mean, it makes sense i mean yeah, 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 you can kind of see how that how that plays out do we yeah. do a good job recycling i mean copper is recyclable right if you take oh, that, sure. you know, people people go to old houses and strip it of wires and sell it sell it to somebody <laughs> believe me they're going to be stripping it up from your existing house if copper prices go if they go yeah. up yeah. uh yeah. so the, the standard response to people when they're presented with we have we don't have enough copper the world is Setting aside the carbon dioxide emissions, to your point, the world is not now mining nor planning to mine enough copper to make all the EVs that are contemplated. That's just a fact. It's not my fact. It's just a fact. We're, we're short by about 200 to 250% uh, in the decade. So when we start building the quantity of EVs contemplated by all these subsidized factories, the world will be short copper. We're not there yet. We're a year or two away from that, but the world will be short copper. And and copper is used in a lot more important things than just EVs. I mean, it's in transmission lines. It's in your home wiring. I mean, it's everything. A, it's a it's a yeah. conductor. That's what's why it's Appli used. Appliances. It's it's the primary use for it is not in EVs right now. But what will happen is if we build the number, we try to build the number of EVs that are imagined, the ratio flips. Uh, EVs become the dominant source of demand for copper. Uh, we're not we're not planning to mine enough of it. It's just that's just a simple fact. Now copper is not substitutable. I, I pick copper because there, except for long distance transmission where you can use aluminum for all local transmission, your house, all these uses for uh, appliances, commercial buildings, you, you don't have a substitute for copper. And so people throw, oh well, recycle it. We'll recycle. That'll solve the problem. Okay, look, let's just stipulate that it, while it's not economically feasible. You could imagine close to perfect recycling. You could imagine demanding it. Forget the price. Here's the problem. You, if you start building millions and millions of EVs tomorrow, which is the plan, none of them will be available for recycling for, let's say, a, a decade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I haven't thrown away any copper recently. Well, and, you know, like, I, I, I know. What, what am I, what am I so doing? What, what are you going to recycle? Oh, oh your right. old appliance. Yeah, well, maybe an old appliance. Actually, my microwave needs to be thrown away. Yeah, you're, so Maybe you're, there's some copper in there. You think I could yeah. sell it? Think I could get a good price? <laughs> <laughs> Just... no, it's, the, the recycling is completely irrelevant to the net demand for copper over the next decade from these these plants. Uh, it, it certainly it's relevant ten or twenty years from now when those things start wearing out. We have to, and they will be recycled because probably by then copper will be. 10 times more expensive and not only will it be worth recycling people steal your car just to take copper at that oh, point it's, a, it's kind of a terrifying process i mean how much copper is in a normal car is uh, a lot fair, well fair amount so a normal car has sort of 100 pounds of copper and an electric vehicle has somewhere between three or 400 pounds of copper per car uh the other factor here is aluminum a mm -hmm. normal a normal car depending on the car Two, two, 300 pounds of aluminum. EVs typically have six to 900 pounds of aluminum because remember I said that the battery weighs 500,000 pounds. The only way you can offset that is to use lots more aluminum to lightweight the vehicle instead of using steel framing and steel body. Right. Of course, aluminum 
is That's incredibly energy intensive. Yeah, just. Well, it's, so it's so it's energy intensive to make, but it's is it is it just as strong, or are we in a more dangerous yeah. car? No, now? you can you can yeah, okay. aluminum. You can make aluminum. That's airplanes are aluminum. I mean, okay, it's just it's just more expensive. Very and, expensive and energy in dollars terms. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just for the audience, you said it's you said five hundred thousand pounds. What you meant is that's the the, the material extraction to make the thousand pound battery. Just Correct. just to be clear, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I mean, so is your average EV that much? Does it weigh a lot more than an average? Yeah. Correct. It does. Even it does when you do overall. the aluminum, even when you do all the aluminum light weighting, if you do a vehicle per vehicle comparison, yeah, if you didn't lightweight it, it would weigh a thousand pounds more than its counterpart, but <laughs> which is a have lot. You, but have you ever debated anyone on this? So I mean, we've gone. I think we've gone through all the factors here. I mean, we've <laughs> we've 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 kicked the dead horse of the of the, the EV <laughs> problem pretty well here. I mean, we talked about the. You know, just the, the 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 basic economics of it. Um, on 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 the, uh, from a convenience standpoint, you know, what what can I really do with this vehicle? Um, actually, one question. Okay, one question I do have on that is, because you've written about this and and talked about it, how much better can that battery technology get? Yeah, because right? I I think there's a lot of people who would assume that okay, yeah, right now I can only get so far with yeah. my battery. Yeah. Right but, now it only take it, it takes forty right. minutes to charge, but you know. In the future, it's going to yeah. be amazing. Like, yeah. How true is that from a physics standpoint? Because there's well, got to be a theoretical limit to how much, yeah. how much energy can be stored in a box. Well, first of all, that it's it's reasonable, but also naive to assume that things will always get better. I mean, let's use airplanes as an example. Airplanes are a lot better, more comfortable, quieter, but they aren't going a lot faster than they have for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, for just physics reasons, we, you know, the speed of sound and making supersonic airplanes go is a lot more expensive and energy intensive. We'll eventually figure out how to make that a little cheaper. And we are now, but it's taken a half a century. Batteries are a fundamentally inefficient way to store large quantities of energy, it's just the physics of it. So the whether you do it in, in weight terms or dollar terms, so we'll do it in we'll do it in dollar terms. Store a unit of energy as oil or natural gas in a tank. To, compared to storing the same amount of energy in a battery, roughly a hundred times more expensive to store energy that way. Hmm. hundred times, not hundred percent, hundred times more. Yeah. But would you do that for a smartphone? Well, hell yeah. I mean, you can't, sense, a, a yeah. little tiny engine for a smartphone, re, you can make them by the way, they exist in, 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 in physics. They're really lousy. Scaling engines down is lousy in physics. Scaling batteries up is lousy in physics. That's just the way mm -hmm. the world is to live in. It's sort of a weird thing, yeah. but that's why that's smartphones are batteries. That's an interesting yeah. observation. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why airplanes run on fuel and smartphones run on batteries. Can you do it at scale? Yeah, that's what Tesla is. You could do it at scale, but it's it's again, you're you're putting, you're taking seventy pounds of gasoline and a thousand pounds of battery. Could you make the battery twice as good? Yeah, at a price, sure. Uh, so five hundred pounds versus could you make the internal combustion engine twice as good? Yes, you can. So now I have a 35 pounds of gasoline versus 500 pounds, same sort of tenfold ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, one of my first views on the invocation of the magic of innovation, just, you know, it's going to get better. It would be to say, well, why don't we wait till it's better instead of subsidizing yesterday's technologies? Because today's technologies aren't good enough for the average person. If you're rich, and you can afford yeah. the new Mercedes EQS, which is, I, I drove one, man, it's it's really nice. I mean, it's $150,000. You get a lot of car for your 150 grand. It's nice, it really is. Beautiful machine. Uh, you can charge it in 40 minutes, 30 minutes, if you wanna pay a lot of money for a supercharger. Mm -hmm. uh, but you wanna buy a $20,000 car, which the 20 to $30,000 price range, which is where 80% of world's cars sell. Uh, the EV increases its cost 50%. That's mm -hmm. very meaningful for most people. So there's just this bizarre gap between this perception that, oh, it'll get better. Yes, it will. But the physics tell you that the rate of improvement in battery, battery electrochemistry is actually slower, this is an irony, than the rate of improvement available in combustion chemistry. Which, we are yeah. Which, yeah, which makes sense. I mean, because again, there's got to be a theoretical limit to how much energy you can put in a box. There's, well, there's, there's, there's got to be, right? So we, <laughs> we, we know that if you had a pound of lithiated chemicals before you make it into a battery, and we had a pound of oil, that, that's the comparison you would start with, right? You have a thousand, 
we'll do a thousand uh, kilowatt hours. I hate to do it in kilowatt hours. The unit is kilowatt hours per kilogram, right? It's a, it's a unit of energy per weight. You go from 1,000 to 10,000. So you have a 10x increase in the starting point. Mm. So if you're doing this in percentage terms, that's 1,000%, right? It's it's a huge, you have this huge advantage in the underlying energy density of petroleum compared to the underlying energy density of lithiated chemicals. So it's more than 10 to 1. And so that's the limit. You can't make the lithiated chemicals as good as, 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 as oil. It's like saying, I'm going to make an elephant as small as an ant. I mean, it, they're just different things. Yeah. And, and, and so that's the economic side of it. But I mean, and again, if, but if you're going to, if you're going to push it, right, if you're going to push the economic side of it and the behavioral side of it, then you would think there'd be a really good reason to push it. It would be, <laughs> it would be like yeah. our lives depend on it, but we've debunked <laughs> that too, because of, of the, of the, of the known carbon footprints of these vehicles. And then, right. and then again, and, and by the way, even if that weren't true, even if it were true that it truly eliminated the carbon footprint, then you got to ask the question, well, what's the effect on the weather? I mean, what's the effect on the climate? And then, you know, if we're talking two to 3% of, of global emissions as the effect, and then, and then, you know, and that's just global emissions. And then you, and then you try to calculate just via our imperfect models, what the actual effect is on future climates. You've got a, you've got a pretty near zero um, calculation there with, of, of benefit right, for, yeah. for, a, for a ton of costs. And I think that's always the point I bring people back to. It's like, look, even right. if all of your assumptions are correct, which they're absolutely not correct, but even if they are, you're still getting no benefit for an enormous amount of cost. And so how the heck are you arguing for this? And, and the truth is the other side has no answers for it. Well, they don't. I've never, but, I've never heard an answer. It's well, they, just because, because we have to. The answer that they invoke is that we are facing a existential threat from a climate apocalypse, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the scientific community, including the IPCC, the international body, as you as you know, they don't use that language. The scientists don't. Even in the no. government UN documents, it's the politicians, it's the it's the uh, the apocalyptics that use that kind of language. But here, you make a really good point. If let's just stipulate. Again, I'm going back to let's just stipulate that there's there's a constituency that believes, let's just, and again, without attribution of motive, they believe we've got to do something about cutting carbon dioxide emissions. And I can't penetrate that conviction. I'll say, but I would say to that same community, if if that's what if your goal is to cut combustion of hydrocarbons, let's let's stick with cars. Uh should, we could at least agree that what we should do is something that would be fast and cheap that would have the maximum impact for the least dollars mm -hmm. on cutting consumption of hydrocarbons in vehicles. We well, you know what that is. If if you want to subsidize that process of reducing oil use for cars, the fastest way to do that would be to subsidize people who buy a more efficient internal combustion engine because we know exactly how much less fuel they use and how much they reduce CO2 emissions. And we could target that to what, what are called super users, which tend to be people who have lower incomes doing jobs that involve driving trucks long distances. We know, we know what that demographic is. If I told that demographic, if I worked out the arithmetic of what an EV subsidy is for the putative reduction in oil use, well, it does yeah. reduce oil, putative reduction of CO2, and instead handed the same dollars per unit of carbon dioxide to the to the gardener who's driving an old f-150 you pay for half his truck instead what we're doing now is we're transferring was transferring money from the middle class taxpayers to the wealthy buying evs right if, we, if i have to make a political trade and i put in a box and you know how i learned this when i worked for reagan white house you have to make trades in politics i can't convince everything everybody of my opinions on climate i know there's a constituency that want to cut carbon dioxide emissions okay i'll make the trade Let's let's give money to uh, super users below a certain income bracket. Pick a number below two hundred thousand, below hundred thousand, whatever number you want. But some number you get you get you get priced out of it. And uh, let's give them the let's give them a check not to buy an electric truck, but to buy more a reduced, efficient. yeah more yeah. reduced oil use. They won't do that, even though that's not only demonstrably faster, better, and cheaper. It's because it, it's almost an emotional aversion to internal combustion engines. But if you're if you're rational about this, why wouldn't you do that? Why why not? 
that's your biggest bang for the buck. Yeah, because I I don't think that's their goal in the end. I mean, it's <laughs> it's it, it's it's a religious obsession with with you know keeping fossil fuels in the ground as if there's some kind of moral good associated with that. All right, so so we, we we've beat up EVs pretty bad. Um, and again, like you said, like a lot against building them, they, they can seem cool. It'd be cool to have a luxury EV. It'd be oh, cool, but I like it. But I just I, I wouldn't pretend that I'm doing anything for the environment by buying one. Um, but so. You know, again, another key assumption in the utopianism here of the, of the radical environmentalists is, you know, to 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 create a, a lesser carbon footprint, you, you charge that EV with with a with a grid powered by renewables only. Um, I, I will say that they're they're at least starting to um, uh, talk more kindly about nuclear energy, which which you know solves a lot of these problems, except for the cost. But there's maybe ways to, to make that cost lower. But for the most part, there's there's still a, a heightened obsession with, with renewables, specifically solar and wind. Right. Um, so let's talk about those energy dynamics and, and what it takes to actually build a, a wind farm, uh, a solar a solar farm, for lack of a better term, and how energy density uh, comes into that mix. I mean, how does what are well, you know, using this using the same kind of logic we're using with sure. EV versus materials required energy density output all of it how does where do we begin that conversation can we can we call can we call uh oil fields oil farms too i think mm -hmm. we should call them oil farms it will sound nicer yeah <laughs> well, the, because... well the thing is is they're not even fields they're just it's just a single location where you drill deep into the ground it takes a, exactly. it doesn't take up enough space to really warrant being called a farm because a farm well, by think... its very nature it takes up a lot of space well some parts of west texas have a lot of a, a lot of uh, farm equipment in the oil industry drilling holes, as you know. Yeah. But yeah. your point is exactly right. It's an energy density issue. Uh, there's a lot of ways to measure energy density in physics, back to the lithiated chemicals and oil. It's the same thing whether you compare a combustion turbine using natural gas in a wind farm, which uh, a wind a wind utility scale generating plant. <laughs> what you'd want to know is. It, this is also knowable. So how, how many tons of material do I need to dig up to build machines? Because mm -hmm. all energy systems require machines. All energy is free, by the way. I mean, this is not a theological or philosophical point. Energy supply in the universe is infinite for our purposes. On Earth, it's infinite. We didn't make it. We didn't invent the sun. We didn't invent oil. Uh, if, whether you believe in a deity or whether you think it just happened, we didn't do it. It's free and it's there. To make oil or wind or sun or natural gas be useful, we have to build machines that occupy a piece of land and that then convert nature's resource into something for us. So the metric that matters, set aside costs, this, this is how you get to the costs and the environmental impacts. How many tons of materials do you have to extract from the earth to build a machine to deliver a mile of driving, an hour of heat, an hour of computer time, a ton of steel, a pound of silicon. You, this is very well established uh, area of engineering and, and science. We know the answer. Roughly speaking, you have to extract from the earth tenfold more materials, concrete, steel, coal, copper, aluminum, all the, the whole class of materials. A thousand percent increase in material extraction and construction of machines to deliver to society the thing we want, the service, a mile of driving, an hour of heat, an hour of light, an hour of computer time. So you have this massive increase in materials requirements, to your point, because of the energy density problem. The sun is, if the sun were an intense source of energy, there'd be no life on Earth, right? It's, it's we're far enough away from the sun, unlike the planet Mercury, where there are, you know, oceans of liquid metal, it's so close to the sun. We, we can live here because the wind doesn't scour the surface of the Earth, lets us build buildings, except occasionally when there's typhoons. So the energy density part means that the land you use is increased roughly tenfold, sometimes more, to get the same unit of energy to society. The materials, to build the machines on that land, the wind turbines, the solar panels, similarly tenfold increase. And if you move the power around a lot by transmission lines, which you have to do because the wind is not conveniently located, you get a tenfold increase in transmission infrastructure. I'm just doing orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. So all of it is land using, habitat destroying, materials using, mining intensive, transportation intensive use of metals, materials, and land to deliver the same unit of service to society that we care about, which is heat, light, materials, service, and travel. 
this is extraordinarily expensive in economic terms, but it's extraordinarily damaging in environmental terms. And a lot of it, of course, is other places. So I would say without judgment, by, by, but just by virtue of their behavior, a lot of environmentalists appear not to care a rat's patoot about children mining metals in Africa, about environmental you know, challenges and ecosystem destruction uh, in African and South American and Central American countries where most of this very difficult you know, labor takes place. The unavoidable impacts, to your point where you started, we can minimize those impacts, uh, but we don't minimize them by chasing energy sources that increase the consumption of the metals and materials. Mm -hmm. So the elect electric grid, so you know, you've heard it over, wind and solar are cheaper. They've reached grid parity, that language, it, <clears throat> which is a disingenuous observation about a very simple fact. When the wind is yeah. blowing or the sun is shining at that hour, that minute, the electricity produced by that machine is cheaper than burning a gas in a combustion turbine or coal in a turbine. That's true. It's also beyond obvious that that's not convenient. We need to produce it all the time. Everybody knows that. Yeah. We do know that the costs to provide electricity all the time when society needs it, when humans need it, causes the cost of electric grids to rise as you add episodic power to it. We know that because in every state of the union, in America, in every country, there is a one-to-one -one correlation without exception. The more wind and solar on a grid, the higher the cost of electricity. Fully correlated every place it's tried. And when you, when you see that fact, and you juxtapose it against this constant mantra, wind and solar are cheaper because the sun is free. Now, this First, it's not cheaper. And the sun being free is totally irrelevant. The machines aren't free, nor is the land on which you put them on. Yeah. This is this is the, the intellectual lie of the solar cheap, better, free thing. I mean, there's also massive subsidies that made it cheaper, that, that made that initial overhaul cost overhead costs cheaper, which, you know, is, is factored into the, uh, you know, the, the marginal cost going forward. So yeah, it, it's disingenuous for a number of reasons. And there's, I, what is it? It's 250 times more subsidies go to, uh, to yeah. maybe either solar or wind. I can't remember which one, but it's a lot more subsidies when it's all said and done um, per unit mm -hmm. of energy compared to uh, nuclear, let's say. Um, well, which, there's a, not to interrupt, but there's an irony. The sub, the electric grid costs, because of the subsidies, you would expect that the rates would have gone down. The subsidies don't show up in the rate base. They're paid for by taxpayers elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So those subsidies, putting cheap, so-called cheap wind and solar on the grids, you would think would result in lower cost electricity. So here's the here's but the thought experiment. Because they're federal, right? And the, and the cost is- But is why did local, the electric yeah. rates go up? If we subsidize the machinery, the well, why rate, do they? What what is the simple explanation for that? For for to those keep, who to keep the know. lights on raises the costs. To keep the lights on when the wind is not blowing and the sun's not shining, those costs overwhelm the lower cost of producing the electricity. And why is that? Because of the the necessity for for I guess dispatchable energy sources in addition right. to the, the the solar and wind. So you gotta keep the like other a, grid there. Right. So you, so you have to have a, a gas plant that can run inefficiently now because it has to ramp Correct. up and down which and Correct. gas plants as i understand are kind of the only plants that can do that well, coal well, plants have to maintain some sort of you could you could cycle a little operating. bit but, not, you can cycle, yeah, but yeah. not a lot well the, the fastest cycling machines are are uh, piston piston engines this diesel uh so-called diesel engines burning out of gas or diesel fuel you can turn them on in about one minute 60 seconds uh and, and spool it's like your car you can turn a big machine on if it's a piston engine machine, turbines take a little longer. Germany did the experiment for us to, to, add, to answer the question in terms of the, Ger Germany's uh, spent about a half trillion dollars of wind and solar, what we're gonna do now, right? We're gonna follow Germany over the last uh, roughly 15, 18 years. Over that time period, Germany's electricity consumption, the country has gone up 8%, 8%. Their electric grid is now twice as big as it was 15 years ago. Hmm. They kept, 80% of the old grid, they turned off the nukes stupidly, but they kept most of their grid and built another one. And now you wonder, that's how they keep the lights on. So now yeah. you wonder why electricity is 300% more expensive? Well, because they built two grids, both operated suboptimally to your point. So you have, you've doubled the grid, you spent all this money and you operate them 
suboptimally, and then you wonder why electric rates are high. This is what we're going to do in America. We're going to we're going to follow Germany. And then, of course, the next question is, you know, is it worth? Is there some massive benefit that they achieved by by incurring the sacrifice? That's what, that, again, that's, their, that's the policy question. So where's the where's their, their, their reduction? Time. They reduced the hydrocarbon use overall in their society by six percentage points. Oh boy. Yeah, and, and I'm not even sure that translates to a serious reduction in carbon. In carbon uh, is, is there? I mean, I've I've heard yeah, it's maybe the well, it's not, same yeah. or it's or whatever. It's down a little. It's down a skosh. It is, but but China's let me put the China's China's increase in one month has wiped out all of Germany's savings for 15 years. Yeah, so it's like what you do doesn't matter. Incurred an enormous cost on you, um, yeah. not just in monetary terms, but you know potentially in in human life terms. Considering yeah, it's cold yeah. in Germany. It's it's people realize it's like kind of the same level as Canada, latitude wise. Um, right. Which is, yeah. by the way, why solar solar panels are insane to install in a northern latitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but okay, so so but they but they'll come back and they say, well, battery storage is is really coming a long way, and yeah. um, you know, and while like the the fancy batteries that you put in a car aren't really great for um, you know grid storage, there's there's other types of batteries like that that, that don't require all of those minerals um, to sure. mine, like the kind of your yeah. sodium based batteries. Yeah. I've heard from some in, some interesting technologies on that front. What what, do, what is your general take on that? Uh, it's a really bad and expensive way to store electricity at scale, no matter what no matter what the chemistry. But you're absolutely right. There are things called flow batteries. There's a variety of classes of chemicals that are lousy for cars because they're too heavy and too big. But you could imagine building them at, for for grids. So the both our uh, administration and previous administrations, we can't blame this this administration. It's been a obsession to build grid scale batteries now for a decade. So e the Energy Information Administration just put out a couple of weeks ago a new report pointing out by 2025 we're going to have 111 gigawatt hours, big number, uh, battery storage on grids by 2025. All right, let's put that in context. That's 15 minutes of US electricity demand, 15 minutes. So at the national scale, it means bupkis, it's relevant. Right. And they It'll still need cost. to be recharged after that 15 but, minutes. There's no yeah, and if you, sure. And if you imagine two hours of battery storage, which, okay, great. At two hours and one minute, the lights go out if you're counting on batteries, because that's, whereas if you have a coal plant and gas plants and nuclear plants, if you have an outage, from a fuel supply, you switch fuel supplies, you could keep it going for, well, you can pile up three months worth of coal or oil or natural gas near a power plant at, at a cost that's a hundred fold less per unit of energy than storing it in batteries. All right. So we've spent a lot of time um, complaining about what what's silly and doesn't really work that well and what will probably <laughs> never work that well. But let, let's talk a little bit let's, because we're coming up on the hour kind of time limit. I, I try to keep these conversations too. Um, <laughs> Talk about okay. the stuff that we that, that I think does work that kind of that, that fits a lot of you know, that checks a lot of boxes. Cleaner for the environment, energy dense, yeah. um, nuclear energy, you know, gas. I, I talk about natural gas exports a lot on this podcast. I don't think we need to, to beat that dead horse. And you know, I always use the because uh, it, it's it's about like like if you care about carbon emissions, what's the quickest way to do that? And I always use the the, the the example of well you got about 50 percent of, of of power let's see i mean let's see electrical power emissions i'm not using the correct terminology there but you know what i mean emissions from power generation right globally 50 percent of that's because of coal yeah. around the world the best place the, the best way to displace coal is through natural gas which, you know so you, you get yeah. about half the emissions so let's just export more natural gas. I, I I beat that dead horse a lot on the on this podcast. But what do you you know just from a physics standpoint? What are you excited about on the nuclear front? Um, how can we improve the because the the big prohibition there is cost, yeah. large overhead costs. Um, not a lot of not a lot of investors super excited to invest in big nuclear plants. What do you think the future is there? Yeah, one quick observation about your natural gas export, and I'm very bullish as you know on that as well. If we feel compelled to subsidize uh, lower reductions in carbon dioxide, we should take all of the Inflation Reduction Act money for green stuff and subsidize LNG exports so that countries yeah. in Pakistan and India could buy LNG cheaper than coal. They're burning coal because it's cheap. 
If yep. you if you sold them LNG at the same price, they they wouldn't hesitate to buy it. But that would cost us a lot of money. But you know, we're it's just it's just our it's just our money anyway. You you get my point. Yeah, that, if you're going to use the money, might, yeah, might as well. <laughs> Jeez. Let's let's help them and help her anyway. So so nuclear energy is the only phenomenology that is profoundly different than anything humans have done since the discovery of fire and combustion engines. There's not, there's nothing. It's it's hard to overstate how much better energy density and material and land use terms nuclear is. It's a bigger leap from where we are, where we do combustion than doing the age of horse and wood to the age of hydrocarbons. It's a, it's a order of magnitude more significantly in terms of energy density and reduction of footprint of all kinds. So it's a huge deal. The phenomenology of nuclear fission is unprecedented in, in human history. It just really is a huge deal. It's also, as we now know, extremely difficult to engineer machines that are affordable that can take advantage of this astounding phenomena, which is nuclear fission. And nuclear fusion is, we could talk about, but it's fundamentally silly to think in terms of having fusion reactors available in timeframes of any meaning. We still haven't figured out how to make what's called a break-even reactor. We're, 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 we're miles away from what's called break-even, more energy out that we put in. But fission, we've now had a half century of building reactors and they've gotten very expensive in large part because the engineering is hard, in large part, larger part, because the regulatory system, especially in the United States, has made it very difficult to uh, to build these things. The exciting thing is that there are something on the order of six dozen, not not six, or there's six dozen different designs that different countries and companies have in progress to build different classes of nuclear power plants. I would have to say probably every one of them will work. We know enough about the engineering now to say there's going to be dozens and dozens of new classes of nuclear power plants, ranging from kilowatt size. So for calibration, your house is probably, I don't know how big a house you have, but let's say it's five kilowatts. Mm -hmm. Typical house is five kilowatts. Big house is 10 kilowatts. Uh, kilowatt class reactors are being built by NASA for a space program for Mars. They can be built. We know how to build them. Wow. Uh, megawatt class reactors, instead of gigawatt, a thousand times bigger, are being built and designed now, which can be used for data centers and refineries, small villages, uh, transportable. The Army has been making, by the way, the Army, which which you have some familiarity with, <laughs> it's, and uh, the Army built, deployed, and operated for decades uh, small reactors, megawatt class and operate for, for operating bases back in the yeah. 50s in Greenland, really? in Greenland, in Alaska, in mm -hmm. Spokane, in, all over the world. There were about a dozen. They decommissioned them in the 60s because the designs were just too expensive mm -hmm. to operate. They worked fine. They're just expensive yeah. and high maintenance machines. So yeah. burning diesel fuel was cheaper. Yeah. But we now know how to build those. Uh, we can we can imagine building factory built high reliability nuclear power plants that can be transported on on a uh, you know semi trailer uh, not for the military yeah. that's that's happening there the, there is a fundamentally incredibly exciting revolution coming in that would it make a difference yeah but keep in mind you know this of course about twenty percent of the world's energy is used to make electricity roughly about a third in America so if you made all the world's electricity nuclear powered, it doesn't eliminate, you're not going to make nuclear powered airplanes. And it doesn't change the battery thing I told you. Batteries la are lousy, so you're not going to make much transportation change. You're not going to change steel making. There's all kinds of things that, that won't change. Right. But it will change an awful lot in terms of reliability, security, flexibility, because the nice thing about a nuke, if you design a nuclear power plant the way you can now design them, it has essentially an on-off switch, has only one fail, failing mode, which is off. You could turn it off or it'll fail off, but it can't blow up, can't melt down. They can run for three years, sometimes five years between fuelings. So you just turn it on. Uh, five years later, you refuel it, turn it back on. I mean, this is really kind of magical stuff. Uh, yeah. Will we get there? Sure. But who will be there first? It'll depend, unfortunately, a lot more on how we change something that you, you know, you've become more familiar with being in the Congress now, figuring out how to restructure our regulatory system so that it's responsive to new technologies instead of an impediment. That's going to be well, tough. I, yeah, and I, I hope that changes somewhat with uh, 
with the um, environmental permitting reform that was that we forced into the uh, the recent debt ceiling debate, um, which should, should dramatically reduce the timelines and, and, and general complexity of an environmental permit, which is which is one of the one of the inhibitions of, of building anything, not just a nuclear plant, but literally anything. I agree. Um, that there's a there's a lot of excitement about that, and I think it was um, kind of got lost in the. I think that was the most important thing you all did as uh, as uh, servants of the people, as they say, because yeah. that'll that'll the thing that worries me, and this will require oversight. Is I'm very familiar with the uh, the deep state, as it's come to know. Uh, they will slow walk it. So you pass a law that says you guys have to do the following things on, on permit yeah. permit timelines. And uh, we, we saw this, uh, the biggest difference between the Obama administration and the Trump administration on oil and gas permitting, there were no laws changed. P permits on federal lands went from 400 days to 40 days after an election. They yeah. went back to 400 days after the last election. Right. No laws. They just changed. slow walk it. They just pretend they didn't see it. You know, they're working on it. They're I'm no busy. Callbacks. I don't have enough it's... staff. You guys don't give right. me enough money. I need more staff. Right. Right. It's the same problem every time. And so that that people don't realize how significant that was. It's unfortunate the debt ceiling debate got so stupid as as these things often do. And um that of course continues this week as as we're as we're speaking. This is the <laughs> this is the week we we just kind of went home without voting because you know. <laughs> Some people had some hurt feelings uh, over what we're, we actually we honestly still don't know. Um, <laughs> so it's just uh, well, welcome to gotta, Washington. <laughs> it's just something else, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, on the nuclear issue that we know, it's kind of frustrating about hearing about, oh, yeah, these new breakthroughs and it's gonna scalable small modular reactors. I'm like, the Navy's been doing this for decades. I don't understand what is new about this technology. Um, well, I, I, I still haven't gotten a great explanation on what's actually new because been... I can tell you what's new. Remember, the Navy has uh, doesn't have an infinite budget, but building building submarines and building fighter pl planes is different than building aircraft that people can fly in for that they can afford and building. Mm -hmm. So it's you learn a lot about the engineering, but you don't learn a, you don't learn enough about economies of scale. But what's changed is two things. The it's a, the the secret revolution in a lot of machines of the last thirty years is in the material science domain, which gets no visibility because it's mm. it's a boring. We 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 have far better materials, and we're able to model things with computers to design uh, machines far faster and far more effectively in a virtual space, if you like, than we could twenty or thirty years ago. So, using new classes of materials and new design techniques that were you could shorten the design process by years if hmm. to, to hours if you use high performance computing what yeah. you would think of as cad cam sure uh, 3d but, printers you know, all that yeah that 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 plus the plus 40 years of data knowledge built yeah. all operating reactors plus the new materials plus the new computing so now you have engineers say i can build a small reactor the small modular reactor is still pretty big but even smaller reactors that yeah. will have these performance characteristics that are probably true and could probably be built in a year or two instead of a decade. We're still talking a few years and we're still talking not the permits to build them at scale, which is what you all fixed in the in the latest debt negotiation. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory yeah. Commission's process, which is a whole separate channel. Yeah, that, that'll be something that the committee takes up this year. That's um, that That is a priority. And, and I would hope it becomes bipartisan. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, but, you know, my colleagues on the other side always think of some excuse. Um, hard to hard to say, but that that that's definitely going to be a priority is, is, is dealing with the NRC. So we've got some good members with some good legislation that's been looking at that for a while. Um, Mark, I don't want to uh, take up any of your time. This has been a great discussion. I think uh, anyone listening will will learn a lot. And uh, again, how to talk to your radical environmentalist one hundred and one. There you go. I will. I will talk to your calm environmentalist. This the yeah. the calm, calm them down with facts and logic. See if that works. Well, <laughs> sometimes it will. Sometimes it won't. Great, great to join you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate well, it. I appreciate you, and have a great day. It looks sunny outside from where you are, and it's the same here. So let's. Uh, we're, we're getting to summer. Time time <laughs> to join the college students in a break. Let's do it. All right. Thanks for being on, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan.